Good evening. I'll try this one more time. Good evening. Awesome. My name is Lauren Anderson, and I am the former. Hold on, I have notes. Who am I? Wait a minute. No, because sometimes you forget. Okay. I am the former principal dancer with the Houston Ballet, and. But more importantly, I am the Associate Director of Education and Community Engagement. And I'm so excited to be here tonight with this wonderful woman sitting to my left, who I'm going to introduce in a minute. Like I said, I do have notes. So some of you don't know who I am and don't know why anyone's clapping, so I'll tell you why. <laughs> um, I started dancing here at the Houston Ballet Academy 50 years ago. Yeah. <sighs> She's old. 50 years ago, I did my first plie and tendu at the Houston Ballet Academy, and I'm so grateful for that. Two years later, I wanted to quit dancing. I was done. I was, it was boring. I, I could jump higher than Eric. I could turn more than the chick next to me. It wasn't that exciting to me anymore. So uh, my mom took me to see a performance at Jones Hall. Um, and I'll never forget. The curtain went up, and this black chick ran across the stage, and I went, <gasps> And then there was another one, and there was another one. There was a stage full of women and men of color. So as a dancer, um, as a young dancer, I didn't know I hadn't seen a black ballerina until I saw one. And it was so exciting because I went, I want to be her. I want to be her. I want to be. So I kept dancing, and here I am. Uh, <laughs> um, I became the first black principal dancer at the Houston Ballet in 1990. And it's because. Right? I saw her when I was younger. I can't say I saw you when I was nine. <laughs> but I saw her in this ballet called Creole Giselle, which is the first time that I saw like uh, a, a full-length classic ballet done by a whole bunch of black people. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. I was like, wow. So, um, I say all that to say welcome. This is Virginia Johnson. She is the, was the prima ballerina with Dance Theater of Harlem years ago and is now the director, the artistic director of Dance Theater of Harlem. I'm on page two. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay, so uh, what got you started in ballet? Um, so I was fortunate to uh, have parents who really believed in the power of arts and making good citizens, good young people. And so my parents made sure that I had ballet lessons and that I had music lessons and I had art lessons because they wanted to make me into a fully evolved person. It was also my mother's best friend had a ballet studio. And so she sent her daughters off to support her best friend. Well, let me tell you, this is a similar part of the story because Theryl Smith was my first teacher, and she fell in love with ballet, but there was nobody in Washington, D.C., where I'm from, who would teach her ballet, because she was black. The schools were all exclusively for white people. So Theryl was fortunate to be a child of a wealthy family, and she took herself off to Paris, and she studied ballet in Paris, and she came back and opened a school. And then she did make it possible for all kinds of young people in my community to be exposed to ballet. So that's why I got started more my mother's idea, but Theryl really opened the door to this art form in a way that I just fell in love with it. Yeah. Uh, you know, I started when I was three, and I kept going, and I kept encountering people saying, no, you can't do this, no, you shouldn't do this, but it's what I loved, and I was fortunate enough to be able to pursue it. Awesome, awesome, okay. So, uh, when did you first hear about Dance Theater of Harlem? <laughs> I know the answer to all these questions. <laughs> she does, she does. It's like she's, she's priming the pump here. Yeah. So, uh, so I, I graduated from a really great school in Washington, and when I graduated, the day of my graduation, the director came to me and she said, okay, you're, you're very talented, you're, you're going to have a career, but nobody's going to hire you in a ballet company. You should go and do something like modern dance, or maybe jazz, things that she had never taught me. <laughs> but things that she knew I'd be able to get a job at. So my parents also weren't so happy about me wanting to be a dancer. So they wanted me to go to college and said, well, I'll go to college in New York. So I went to New York University because I figured if I could get to the center of it all, I could actually find a place in the company. 
uh, and I was at NYU, and it was a nice program, it was a modern program, the floor was wonderful. You know, we did a lot of stuff on the floor. But um, my heart was in ballet, and somebody said, well, you know, Arthur Mitchell is uh, teaching ballet classes up in Harlem on Saturdays. You can go up to Harlem and get your ballet fix, and then come back downtown and do the real dancing. <laughs> But I went up to Harlem and found out that Arthur Mitchell was teaching classes in Harlem, and he was starting a company. Okay, so tell them who Arthur Mitchell is. Arthur Mitchell was the first African American to be a permanent member of an American ballet company, the New York City Ballet. And he had a towering career. He was a, um, really a singular artist. He was, of course, a star of New York City Ballet, but he also performed on Broadway. He did some things in the movies. He was just a, a very dynamic and talented individual. And so he was the, the go-to person. The Ford Foundation in the 1960s was thinking about this idea of integrating ballet in the 1960s. Okay, how many years ago was that? Yeah. Uh, and so he, they gave him scholarships and he would go around the country and he would visit schools and he would find talented young people to bring back to the New York City Ballet School, School of American Art, Ballet, to start creating more people of color in this country. So Arthur Mitchell had come to Washington uh, in the spring of 2018 and he went to a school called Jones Haywood. It's a really um, very important black school in Washington. Wait, when? In the 1960s. Maybe, not, not in the 68, maybe in the 60s. Did she say 2000? You said 2000. Not 2018. Not 2018. Oh. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> 1968. 1968. There we go. <laughs> okay. So he was, uh, he was actually, so that was my first exposure to Arthur Mitchell. Right. Now, he was a dynamic, Ooh. dynamic person. Um, he could yell louder than anybody you could ever imagine. <laughs> but he also was about making, making you understand what the standards were and about making you understand that you had to give your all to be able to participate in the art form. And so he was very, he was scary, but he was inspiring. And so that was my first dose of Arthur Mitchell. And when somebody said, he's teaching on Saturdays, I was like, oh, am I ready for that? But I wanted to dance. This is what I wanted to do. So I took that chance. Okay, so um, you might as well just hold it. <laughs> I'll hold it for you. Okay, so, all right, I'm going off script. So when you met him, had, did he have the, when he was teaching classes on Saturdays, did he have the company Dance Theater of Harlem yet? No, no, he created Dance Theater of Harlem um, uh, as a community school because, uh, should I tell the whole story? It's about okay. him, yes. All right. So, so Arthur Mitchell, as I said, had, had a big career. And he was a very respected artist in this country. And so the US government was um, trying to build stronger relations with Brazil. And so um, we all know the arts bring people together. So they wanted us, they wanted to build a ballet company. And they said, Arthur Mitchell, go down there and create a company so that we can have this partnership. And so he was on his way to um, Rio on April 4th. 1968, <laughs> which is, of course, the day that Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated. And that, that stopped him in his tracks. And he said, well, you know, what, why am I going off to some foreign country to do this work when there's so much that needs to be done at home? But what can I do? I'm a ballet dancer. They looked around his home community of Harlem, and he saw a lot of despair. The schools were terrible, the housing was awful, the, the food, there was no hope for the young people of Harlem. And he said, you know what? I'm gonna teach them a classical art form. Because when you study a classical art form, you gain life skills that can transform you. Skills like focus and self-discipline, and that one that all ballet dancers know so very well, perseverance. Perseverance. <laughs> Push through, follow through, all You know, things, no yeah. matter how many times somebody says no, no matter how many times somebody says that's not enough, no matter how many times you fail, but you go back to go do it again, that's what you need to be successful in life. Right. Arthur Mitchell wasn't really thinking about making a ballet company. He wasn't thinking about doing anything but changing the possibilities for the young people in Harlem. And you know, he opened the school in the summer of 1968, and he, he had 400 kids wow. right away because he was dynamic, and he was impassioned, and they could feel. How many of you study ballet? When you're studying ballet, you can, you can feel your progress, or your lack of progress. 
But you, you actually understand, you get out of it what you, what you put into it. Yeah. And if you stick to it, you get better. Yeah. So that was something that was really excited, exciting for this group of young people to have this possibility. Um, but he also looked around at these young people, this 400 kids, shining faces, looking up at him. And he said, well, you know, they need something to aspire to. They need role models in front of him. And so that's where my story intersects with the origin story of Dance Theatre of Harlem, because I got to New York just at the moment where he said, they need role models. I'm going to make a company. And so I was at, I was taking class on Saturday, and I noticed these four other dancers, and then there were six other dancers, and then there was me, part of this company that he was building to create this vision for these young people. But he also very, very, very much had a second purpose. He w wanted people to understand that this art form of classical ballet belongs to everyone. You need opportunity. You need access. You need talent. You actually need quite a bit of money, too, because it's very expensive to study. But by creating that possibility, you create the place where people can become great artists as well. And you know, I, I pinch myself that I've been part of this organization because it's what I dreamed of, but it was also something that gave me purpose in life. So you were one of the originals. Yes, I was. A, I am a founding member of Dance Theater Power. That's where I was going, Louis. I did see her when I was nine. I did see her. When I, was nine. <laughs> I know. There we go. And wow. I knew that, but I wanted her to get there. I wanted her to get there. Okay. So, uh, what's your favorite role that you danced in Dance Theater of Harlem, and why? So, um, uh, a little detour before I get to my favorite yeah. role. Uh, because, of course, uh, Arthur Mitchell performed with New York City Ballet, and that was the ballet company that George Balanchine was the, the principal choreographer for. Uh, and so, the style of that company, of Dance Theater of Harlem in the beginning, was neoclassical. And it was something that I was not exposed to at all. And it was, a, it was a big struggle. I had to use my perseverance to hang in there because neoclassical dancing is so very different from mm -hmm. the kind of training that I had in Washington. But by extending myself and understanding how to move in a different way, it gave me the possibility to be a stronger dancer. Um, so for the first years, the choreography was by Arthur Mitchell and, and George Balanchine. That's a nice combination. Oh, that's wonderful. <laughs> Um, but uh, it was later on, and it was probably towards the 80s, the early 80s, that Dance Theater of Harlem started doing story ballets. And that really is the area that I, I excelled in. Um, I think the first one that we did was Streetcar Named Desire. Uh, and I got to play D Blanche Dubois. It was amazing. Uh, and then we had uh, Fall River Legend, mm -hmm. which was choreographed by um, Agnes DeMille. Uh, and it was the story of Lizzie Borden. Yep. And I had to wield an axe on stage. <laughs> uh, and that was a lot of fun. And then uh, in the mid-80s, we got Creole Giselle, which was just a, a total... Stunning. Stunning. It was a, a surprise. I'm 5'8". You know, Giselle is usually this delicate little thing. I don't know how I, I got to do that. But it was a, a, a great joy to dance that ballet. OK, so those that don't know, Creole Giselle is the story of Giselle that happens in Louisiana. That's. It, the exact same story, it just happens. You know a little bit about Louisiana, don't you, sir? <laughs> okay, so, um, so you perform, and you retire, and what do you do after retirement? Well, I had made a, uh, um, an agreement with my parents that when I uh, left college that I would return to college, and I did. I went back to college, and I was working on a communications degree, and I got the chance to um, interview for a job for a, a magazine called Dance Spirit, uh, which is a, a dance magazine for young people. Uh, and I went in there, and they said, well, you know, we're thinking about starting a ballet magazine. What do you think should be in it? And uh, I went home, and I made an outline because I was in college. And I thought about <laughs> all of the things that I wish somebody had told me about being a professional dancer went while I was dancing. Because you know, what happens is you, you, you're a student, and then you graduate, and you get a job, but it's just like you just keep doing it, nobody gives you any information about how to do it, how to be successful, how to, how to do the work that you're doing. And so I, I 
went back to them and I said, well, this is what you should do. And they said, oh, that's great. We'll do it and you'll be the editor. <laughs> <laughs> and that was the beginning of Point Magazine. Um, yeah. I actually told them I couldn't do that because I didn't know anything about publishing and I didn't know anything <laughs> about being an editor and they said, well, we'll teach you. Yeah. Yeah. And that was, that was a joy. I learned yeah. a whole new field and at the same time I got to connect back to Valley in a yes, way that you I did. before. Okay, there's a story, there's a story. So, she becomes the editor of Point Magazine. At that time I'm still dancing. And we're doing a ballet called Peter Pan here. And uh, I, I knew that I was going to do this interview with someone from Point Magazine. I don't know who. I just know that in between shows, I have to hurry up, take off my makeup, get myself together, do this interview, and then go back in the, for the next show. So I'm walking down the hallway, downstairs. I'll never forget this day as long as I live. I'm walking downstairs in the basement, and I'm going to where, down the hallway. And this woman, who's 5'8 and stunning, floating towards me. And I go, <gasps> and I literally, for the first time in my life, was speechless. <laughs> and it was her. I couldn't believe it. I had just met my idol, the person I'd been. I, I went, <laughs> and then we did an interview, and we've been friends ever since. Absolutely. It's been wonderful. Absolutely. OK. That's my Virginia Johnson story. Actually, I have many, but that's the one you're going to get today. OK. So what brought you back to Dance Theatre of Harlem? So Arthur Mitchell brought me back to Dance Theatre of Harlem. Um, Dance Theatre of Harlem has had success over its 53 years, but it's also had tremendous financial struggle. And uh, in 2004, Dance Theatre of Harlem was going through some very rough times. And there was an idea to save the institution which is a school, a community program, and a professional touring company, that they wanted to put the touring company on hiatus for a little bit of time just to get the finances straight. So in 2004, the touring company was put on hiatus. Uh, it was actually a very tragic moment. It was horrible. Uh, because there were, and the, the company in 2004 was exquisite. And there were dancers in that company who could not find jobs in other companies whose careers were over because of this financial crunch. And it was heartbreaking. But the organization did survive. The school continued. The, the, the uh, community programs continued. Um, so in 2009, Arthur Mitchell um, was really at, at the end of his rope. He said, well, why, ha we have to have something happen. We need the company back. We need to do something to make this happen. Uh, but the board was not willing to take any chances. And so he said, OK, I'll step down, but you have to let me appoint my successor. So I pick up the phone one day, and it's Arthur Mitchell. And he says, well, Virginia, I'm, I'm thinking of stepping down, and I want you to take over. <laughs> horrible, I know. Horrible, horrible, horrible. This is not something I'd ever wanted to do ever in my life. It's a terrible job. You've heard about this job, haven't you? It's just like, wow, it's, it's one problem after another. And, and you have to really have a certain amount of drive, a certain amount of vision, a certain amount of uh, tenacity to make sure that you withstand all the storms that come your way. 100%, let me tell you. Um, but on the other hand, this is Arthur Mitchell, the person who'd given me the life that I dreamed of, given me the possibility who created possibilities for generations of dancers. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't say no. I had to say yes. Against my better judgment, I said, OK, I will give it a try. And he said, OK, and your job is to bring the company back. <laughs> so, but you know, I think the thing that happened was, I think this country actually needs dance theater policy. It's an important institution. It's an important vision of what ballet is. Ballet is not one thing. You have a, a magnificent company in this country, in this city. It is beautiful, but there are so many ways for ballet to be magnificent, and we have to realize that. We have to have that experience. So I said, "All right." We took two years to stabilize the organization. We had a lot of um, philanthropic support because there were a great number of people who felt that Dance Theatre of Harlem was an important institution that needed to be revived. And so we went through a very rigorous process of figuring out, 
but what should the company look like and how can we make this work in this time? Now this is in 2009. We're just coming out of 2008. And so the recession is still very painful for many, many people. Uh, so, you know, a group of consultants got together and they said, well, let's right-size Dance Theatre of Harlem. <laughs> and uh, in 2004, there were 48 dancers. And we had two semi-trailers full of e equipment and scenery and a sprung floor that we traveled to every city. You know, that kind of situation was not going to be our reality to bring Dance Theatre of Harlem back. We had to bring back a company that could thrive in very strongly reduced circumstances. So right sized was 18 dancers. And so we had to create a whole new repertoire because the repertoire for the former Dance Theatre Problem Company was much too big. The casts were all too big. The, our signature ballet was Firebird. I know. I 32 know. dancers. We don't have 32 dancers. So, so it's, been, it's been a very interesting learning curve for me personally to be artistic director of Dance Theatre Problem. But it's also been wonderful to be there over these 10 years. The company came back, we brought the company back in 2012. And we are once again a touring company. Mm. And it is a joy, it is a joy. And a headache. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I know that you have orange yes. in your repertoire, you're gonna see it tonight. So why did you want this ballet for Dancy in Apollo? So, um, it's a, it's a beautiful ballet, mm. first of all. It's wonderful, and it's, it's been a joy to, to watch the, the company um, grow in it and have many different kinds of experiences in Orange. But it came about mainly because uh, it must have been in 2016 or 17. Um, Terry Orr, who was the artistic director of uh, Pittsburgh Valley Theater, uh, and a, a personal friend. He called me up and he said, well, we'd like to share the stage with Dance Theatre Problem. What, what can we do? Uh, and so the first year we shared the stage and we did a work that was, we shared the program. We did two works, they did two works. And then the second time we came back uh, and they wanted to do something where we were actually in the ballet on the stage together, two companies sharing the stage. And Orange is very unique in that it has an opening and it has a closing that has the full cast. And it has three sets of duets, pas de deux, that are done by two sets of dancers. And we could mix the, the companies up that way. So it's a very flexible ballet. So our first time sharing the stage with another company was with Pittsburgh Ballet Theater. Right. Uh, and then um, we were doing it, I think, we were working on it at Chautauqua. We had a wonderful bubble, uh, bubble residency during the pandemic in which we were in far western New York working in studios together, partnering without masks, because it was just the company working together. And we were working on Orange, and the dancers were videotaping each other, and the, they, of course, posted it to Instagram. And then I pick up the phone, and it's Stanton Welch. <laughs> <laughs> and Stanton says, I'm watching your dancers in my ballet. We should do this together. <laughs> and so it worked out that way. Awesome. I'm so excited about this. So, um, okay, done with that paper. Uh, I'm trying to think of, is there anything else? I think that's, I think we got to Orange and that's where I wanted to get to. Yes. And I'm sure that there are some questions that you have because it's not gonna be my fault if they're ding, ding, dinging and we're sitting in here, right? So I wanna give you an opportunity to ask any question you have of either one of us, mostly, Ms. Jones. Yes, I'm going here and I'm coming back there. She asked, what are the plans for the future? Well, um, very much uh, to continue to do col collaborations of this kind. Because, you know, this, this problem of ballet, and I'm gonna call it a problem of ballet, that people really don't understand how African Americans or people of color fit into the art form. The only way that you can have it solved is by showing. And so, one of the things that I like best about Dance Theatre of Harlem that means the most to me is that we are a touring company. That we have a very important message, that we ha are a demonstration of what's possible in this art form, and we take it everywhere. Now, I also learned, though, that people have come to see Dance Theatre of Harlem as the exception. Oh, well, of course there's Dance Theatre of Harlem. They dance, and they look wonderful, but they are them. 
but ballet is this. So the more collaborations that we have, the more times that we have to share the stage, to bring our dancers together with dancers. You know, resident companies such as Houston or Pittsburgh or um, Joffrey, their audience is used to seeing ballet look a particular way. And so in order to enable the audiences to understand that ballet can look many ways, you have to keep planting those seeds. And you can't bring the exception and have people go, oh yeah, I love that, but now I'm going to go back to ballet. We have to go where ballet is perceived to be this way and see how it can be different and how it can be equally beautiful. Differently beautiful, I get that. Differently beautiful, but equally beautiful. Now you know I'm a brag on Houston, right? Because yeah. Houston is used to seeing ballet look equally beautiful, aren't you? Because that's one company I will say that through the years, not just when I was there, I'm saying like you can go to Houston Ballet now. Yes. And we are a com we are a combo platter, yes. which has been great. I love it. We I love it. Which has been awesome. Mm -hmm. But I do agree. I think dancing to problems is very important and that I'm so happy you guys are a touring company now, again. Again. Because again. that's how I got to see you. Mm -hmm. That's how America has gotten a chance to experience you because everyone can't get to New York to see Dancing to Harlem. Right. So I'm glad you're back on the road. Thank you. And I'm glad you're here. Yes, sir. So what I was gonna ask, Harlem is changing and you know, in some ways it's becoming more integrated, but I just wanted to get you on these wondering how that's affecting how you do your I didn't hear the beginning of his question. Well, that's because I didn't get a chance to get on it. No. I was wondering how the changes in Harlem itself, right? Harlem has become much more integrated than it normally was. And I was thinking about Houston. Same thing. And I'm wondering how that affects sort of how you're doing your mission. Exactly. OK. Yeah. Great. Yes, Harlem has changed vastly. Um, I, some people use that word gentrified. Yeah. Uh, you know, when I walk up the block to the studio, I see all these Audis and Teslas and <laughs> Porsches, and I was like, wow, this is not the, the neighborhood I knew. Yeah. And so there, there's definitely some tension in the, in the community around how this, you know, has, how many people have been to Harlem? There is some gorgeous architecture. There are yeah. some gorgeous buildings in Harlem. And so those buildings are being renovated, made fancy, and, and priced out of the range of the community that has come to live there, that came to live there in the 1930s. That's when yeah. the changeover, when Harlem became the black center of, of uh, New York. Um, so the thing that's important to me right now is to make sure that we are a bridge between these communities and that we find a way to have people be together and understand what the value is that we, of course, continue to support our community program and our young people who are in Harlem to give them opportunities through Dance Theatre of Harlem, but we also want to connect the different dispar disparate communities that are becoming enclaves in the city rather than community, a new community made up of a diverse population. For many, many years before the pandemic, we had uh, the first Sunday of every month, we had what we called Sunday matinees, and we would invite guest artists, and the company would perform, and the community would come in, and they were free and open to the public. And that was a great place. There'd be a reception afterwards, so people would mix and mingle and have a chance to really feel, oh, you live across the street? Well, I live across the street. Oh, well, look, you know, that kind of thing. It was beautiful. Well, COVID has put a stop to that. Uh, we, and that right now, our Sunday matinees are virtual, but we're looking, we're hoping to be able to resume the Sunday matinee series and be a locus for the community again. Yes? How do you deal with the other resident companies in New York City? With open arms. <laughs> so, you know, one of the things that happened during the pandemic was uh, the Band Together Festival. And in that festival, we have Dance Theater, Pro oh, let me do the, the um, Band Together. B, Ballet Hispanico. Yeah. A, Alvin Ailey American Dance Theater. A, American Ballet Theater, N, New York City Ballet, D, Dance Theater of Harlem. And we came together to create a festival of performances for the, for the city of New York because everybody had been locked away during the pandemic. And we did it at Damrosh Park, which is at Lincoln Center, outdoors. So there, were, there are things about the pandemic that have been terrible, but there are things about the pandemic that have been good. You know, once upon a time, yes, we were all competitors. 
trying to, to say, I'm better than you, I've got a better audience than you, we do the, 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 but now we've come together to say, we're doing this and we need to bring our art to as many people as we can. So it's, it's really changed the tone of the way that we interact as, a, as, as companies. Uh, so your question, how do we deal with other? I was thinking of just those companies then and Mark Morris. And Mark Morris, yes. Oh yeah, and so now there are a bunch of companies in New York that are mad at the band companies <laughs> because we left them out. Right. Well, but I, I will say the good news is a lot of dance companies have gotten together. We're not working in silos anymore. Where there are more collaborations, online, offline, and uh, like this one, right? There's someone. Oh yes. Okay, the question is, oh wow, what was the first one? <laughs> I was on that education and community engagement question, that's what happened to me, sorry. Oh, how many dancers are in the company now, mm -hmm. and are you doing outreach? I know that you've done it in the past, because mm -hmm. you used to go to HSPBA, because when I was a kid, my dad took me out of school to see you guys. Oh, wow. Yeah, yes. he was a principal of PBA, so he could do that. Oh. But, but yeah, so what, what are you doing? to let the community that may not know you, know you, mm -hmm. and when you're touring, mm -hmm. and how many dancers are in the company. Okay, okay. very good. So we are 18 company members at this point. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm hoping that we can go up to 20, but right now we're still 18. Uh, so we are, uh, community engagement is an important part of our work in New York, but also on the road. Uh, and so we often do split weeks in which we are in two cities per week. And we work with our presenters to make sure that we have community engagement. We do master classes. We do what's called now, instead of lecture demonstration, we call Inside Ballet with Dance Theatre of Harlem, which are um, presentations in the theatre where we are giving an evening performance, where we um, show what goes into the making of a dancer, how we prepare ourselves. We show them a little bit of stagecraft, we talk a little bit about choreography, and then we show them some excerpts from the work. So it's an, it's a, a, an arts exposure experience for young people. Uh, and it's an important part of every city that we go to, because that's why we exist. As Lauren said, you know, she was exposed as a young person. You have to give people this spark at the beginning and give them a chance to see what might be possible. So it's something that we always work out. We, we do it through each presenter. Uh, when we're in, I don't think we're presenting, we're not self-presenting in any, any cities right now. So it's a negotiation with that. But we also work with local groups. We work with the links. We work with the society to say, well, bring your kids in. Can you subsidize some tickets to a performance if they can't come to a lecture demonstration in the morning? So we work with local groups to make sure that we're reaching as far as we can as that young population. Anyone else? Yes. Uh oh. Wait a minute. One more time. That was my closing. But that's okay. When are you coming to Houston? You're coming in February. We are coming to Jones Hall <laughs> yeah, in February. In February. <laughs> yes, very excited. Yeah. I know. It's been a long time. It's been it's a long, long time. Long. Yeah, Dan Cedar College has been coming to Houston for a long time. A long time. Yeah. And you always go to Jones Hall. They go to Jones mm -hmm. Hall every two or three years mm -hmm. for the past 20 something, 30 something, 40, let's see, 40 something years. <laughs> yeah, you guys, it, it's up. Uh, so, Dan Cedar of Harlem does come in February 2023, and they're presented by Performing Arts Houston. Yes. Yeah. So right, how many dancers do we have here in Houston right now? So we, you've had um, six company members have been here since um, uh, a week ago. Yeah. The 23rd. The 23rd. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> working to build the, the company, build the orange together. It's going to be a mixture of casts over the six performances. There are going to be different casts for each performance. Uh, and so uh, they've been working with uh, the Stanton and with Amy Fode and Sean Kelly to be to just come together as a, a, a unified ballet. And it's been wonderful. I was uh, here for the first day, and then I came back 
today. Yeah, we both got here today. <laughs> we, both, we both got in town today. <laughs> and I watched some of the rehearsals, so I'm very excited to see the performance tonight. Yeah, it's going to yeah. be great. It's going to be great. Yes? Is it uh, challenging and difficult to change environments everywhere you go? Is it challenging and difficult to change environments everywhere you go? It's incredibly stimulating to change environments everywhere we go. Yes. Yes. Um, Stimulating? Yeah. You know, uh, I was a dancer with the company for many years. And you know, changing beds on tour is really hard. You never, you never get a bed that you yeah. like. But the other thing is that changing stages and changing theaters, you know, the, the feel of the floor is something that's crucial to your performance. And you get there, we have a tech, and we have a performance. That's right. And then you go on to the next city. So it, you, have to, you have to say, oh, on your toes. <laughs> uh, so that's very challenging. Also, every theater has a different warmth, a different feel. The theater itself. And then the audience has a different feel. You know, we were just in Tallahassee last night. We were just completing a, an engagement that was supposed to happen in 2020. Beautiful theater, lovely sprung floor. We had been in Muskegon last week, and small theater, smaller, more, more hard floor. The audience in Muskegon felt different than the audience in Tallahassee. So when, you, when the curtain goes up, the dancers have got to get to that mode where they're like, OK, what are they giving me? What's happening? And it takes a little bit of time, because Muskegon had been one temperature, and I'm not talking about Fahrenheit. <laughs> And, and Tallahassee had been another. And so that's really the beauty of performance, yeah. because then you're working together. That's the dancers right. are working with the audience, and the audience is taking it in and figuring out and coming in. And so by the end of every performance, you're in a really fabulous place. I'm going to knock on wood with that. <laughs> but the beginning, you have to find each other. You know, and that's why it's, it's, a, it's a stimulating profession. I always tell my dancers to get on stage and take a breath in and breathe out so you can get the, the aroma of the audience. <laughs> you can feel, because it's a different show. You can do the same show every night and it's different yeah. because the audience is different. You dance for who's in front of you, right? Last question. Yes, sir. So can you tell us about recruiting dancers? Ooh. Recruiting dancers. Recruiting dancers. Well, I'll tell you this. Um, back in 2012, we did a national tour. Uh, because I was going to start the Dance Theatre Problem up again, and I, I was looking for dancers. And you know what? It, it broke my heart. DTH had been off the stage for almost 10 years, and where we had 200 people in the audition, maybe 10 of them were of color. And maybe of those 10, three or four of them had had the kind of training that was necessary to be the level of ballet dancer that I needed. And so I had to rebuild the company because the dancers weren't there. There hadn't been the experience of little Lawrence seeing Dance Theater Paul and getting ready to go. We had to start again. And that was, that was really sobering. But it was also galvanizing. It's like, OK, we really have to make this happen. Mm -hmm. Now, that's not so much the case now. And, and certainly, we see wonderful dancers. We just had an audition in, um, oh, we had a virtual audition last year. I won't tell you about that. <laughs> but we had an audition in uh, February of this year, and I was really impressed by the level of the dancers who came to the audition, uh, by the number and the skill that they showed. You know, I had some tough decisions to make, so that was a good thing. Well, I want to say I'm honored to be sitting here with you. As am I. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm so excited for you guys, because you're going to get to experience a very special show tonight. This is the first of many. I, don't, I really can't speak for Stanford Welch or Houston Ballet, but I will. I'm sure this won't be our last collaboration. And, and I'm so excited to see your dancers. I know them. I've taught them. I know them. Um, I've had the pleasure of seeing them this week, and they are spectacular. And I know that our dancers, and I should say our dancers, are enjoying each other. So you are in for a treat tonight. Thank you so much for joining us today. Let's give another huge round of applause to the wonderful women tonight. And you know, I want to say to you all, thank you for supporting Houston Ballet. 
because we couldn't do this without you. Thank you so much.